One of the most common problems we see when modifying a streetcar into a race car is keeping the engine cool. And this is a topic that I know a lot of enthusiasts struggle with, particularly knowing what to do and how to address that problem. To get a little bit of insight into these issues and how to address them, we're here with Jack from CNR to find out what goes into a cooling system design. So Jack, for a start, I think it's, it's really common that a lot of people, when they've got a car that's overheating, think that the solution is just to fit a bigger radiator. Is that going to solve people's problems in most instances? Uh, probably not, because when most people think of a bigger radiator, they think of putting a thicker core in there. And, and nine times out of ten, the issue is airflow. And putting a thicker core in there is just going to restrict that airflow even more and really provide diminishing returns. Okay, so getting airflow through the core, how can we improve the airflow? One way is to uh, actually thin up the core a little bit or change the fin design. And another way is to improve the ducting. Uh, the area directly in front of or behind the radiator is critical. And if you don't have a good airflow path and, and aren't forcing the air through the radiator, you'll really see a drop off in performance. Okay, so let's just come back, we'll do all those two topics separately. So first of all you said that going to a thinner radiator can actually improve things and this would seem really counterintuitive to most, as you say most people go with a, a thicker radiator. So how, how does that improve the airflow, is this just reducing restriction to the airflow? Yeah, reducing the static pressure loss between the front and back face of the cooler, that's essentially what provides the airflow through the, through the radiator. So by moving to a thinner core and then maybe changing the fin design to increase the louver angle or provide more active surface area for the cooling, you can actually provide uh, the customer with a radiator that has additional cooling capacity. So I think you've just touched on that, I want to go a bit deeper there, the, the active surface area as you've just mentioned to it, most, most people would think again going to that thinner core, you've got less core in the airflow so the heat can't basically be passed into the airflow, yeah. so is that where you're actually gaining that back with the fin design? Correct, yeah, so the, the fin design, especially the fin design that we use, has a lot of little louvers built into the fin through, through a forming process. Uh, so by that, we're actually creating a lot more surface area for the air to interact with the, with the uh, radiator and, and thus transferring more heat. All right, so moving on to the other topic you mentioned there, which is ducting, and I think this is an area that so many people overlook, the fact that air is actually lazy, so it yeah. doesn't really want to go through the radiator, so uh, how do you go about ducting it, what are you talking about specifically there, and, and what's important to keep in mind? Uh, so definitely an important thing to keep in mind is that you want to create a good seal between the radiator and the ductwork. You want to try and provide ductwork that has you know, no sharp edges or sharp corners. You want to try and transition it to the front, front of the car or the, or the roof of the car or the back of the car, however you're doing so, uh, as, as smoothly as possible. Is there any rule of thumb in terms of the size of the opening at the front of the car for that ducting versus the radiator or is that very dependent on the application? It is very dependent on the application. Uh, in a, quite a few instances we've stuck to a, a one third rule. Uh, one third of the core face area to the opening at the front and that and that served us pretty well in the past. Uh, it might not be optimised but it's a good starting point to uh, try and achieve the most efficient design that you can. It's, it's one thing to get the air ducted to the radiator but of course when it goes through the radiator it's got to get out the other side and I think this is another area that is, is really easy to overlook. So can you talk us through some of the considerations there with what happens in the engine bay? Yeah definitely, ducting, ducting out the rear side of the radiator is important because if you just allow the air to flow loosely into the engine bay it's going to be lazy and it's not going to find its way out and it's going to really block everything up and create a high pressure point behind the radiator not allowing any air through. So ducting out the bonnet or the hood, trying to get my verbiage right, uh, is, is the best way because there's a lot of large flat surface area there to just vent straight out the top. Uh, but you can also vent out through the wheel wells or through the side of the car as well with, with good effect. Now, I, I'm not sure if there are any options you can suggest here, but for, for the average enthusiast, maybe modifying their street car, attending track days and if they've got cooling problems, if they're suspecting that they've got everything else right and maybe there's an airflow problem out the back of the, the radiator, is there any way they can actually do simple tests without getting too technical on whether that's actually the, the issue restricting the airflow? That's, that's probably a pretty tricky thing to do. I mean, what, what a lot of uh, race teams will do at the track is actually just have different bodywork setups to, to test different things. Um, a lot of guys will just use very thin sheet metal uh, or even core flute I've seen before used uh, and, a, and a hacksaw to, uh, to test out different theories but it, it, it is a tricky thing to do and it is that next level. 
Now, getting the engine coolant uh, under control is one thing, but, but again, that's only part of the, the puzzle there because we've also got uh, oil in the engine, obviously there for lubrication, but the oil is also taking a lot of heat away from the combustion process, and uh, we need to control that as well. So can you give us some considerations, particularly if we've got a, a factory engine that may have no oil cooling, uh, what, what can we do to help rectify that? Definitely, just a just a simple remote mount oil cooler kit uh, running running off a off an oil filter adapter uh, will really help both with the engine oil cooling, but also with the with the engine coolant cooling, uh, because the oil has more direct contact with the engine. Sometimes putting an oil cooler on can actually drastically help your water temps as well. Uh, those kits are normally pretty easy to mount anywhere in the car. Um, for some of the more serious enthusiasts and high-end applications, we'll also do a full-face oil cooler behind the radiator, which plays into as well, you know, by moving to a slightly thinner radiator sometimes, you can open up the, the rear of that package to do additional oil or transmission cooling. Now, there's actually an interesting aspect I wanted to touch on. I know that a lot of people, when they are adding an oil cooler, uh, it can be a little bit tricky, particularly with modern cars, to find room in the front of the car to mount it. And a lot of people might get a little bit lazy rather than ducting it properly, fitting the oil cooler this time actually in front of the radiator. So can that work or is that making things worse for yourself? It, it can work uh, in, in certain applications. Typically we recommend against it uh, because you're essentially taking some of the cool air that you would be using to cool your coolant, cooling the oil and then even potentially heating up your coolant with, with that patch behind the engine oil cooler. So it can, it can be a downside. Uh, understandable that if your oil temperature may be north of 120 degrees C, uh, then the air coming out of that oil cooler is, is going to be pretty pretty toasty, pretty so toasty. reducing the effectiveness of the radiator. Now, just moving back to what you said there, putting the oil cooler as a package behind the radiator, and we see this quite often uh, with a factory or OE style oil cooling where they have an oil uh, to water heat exchanger. And this gives the benefit of actually bringing the oil up to temperature faster because the coolant comes up to temperature quicker. Uh, do we see the same effect with a oil to air a cooler that's fitted behind the radiator? Definitely, exactly the same effect. Uh, you'll have the hot air off the radiator hitting the oil at startup, uh, and then uh, during uh, race application or, or something like that, you'll see uh, the hot air off the back of the radiator still doing some cooling on the oil cooler. And where you might need a, a relatively small oil cooler in a side duct or something like that to do the cooling, by doing a full face oil cooler you're taking full effect of all of the air off the back of that radiator and, and essentially creating the most efficient coolant package. You know, The most efficient cooling package is defined by the air temperature off the back of the, back of the last cooler. If you're using up all the energy potential in the air, you've got an efficient design. All right, so if people want to find out a little bit more about the CNR products, uh, where can they go to? Uh, www.crracing.com Perfect, thanks for your time there Jack. Thank you. If you liked that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up, and if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.